was off limits that we could not attack. And then came Vietnam. U.S. fighter bombers continue to step up the air war in Vietnam in a series of heavy attacks on Viet Cong positions. It's the biggest number of raids in a single day since November last year. Among the targets, railroad lines, transformer stations, supply camps, and enemy convoys. The war in Vietnam would prove even more frustrating for air commanders. High-speed fighter bombers were used repeatedly to hit strategic targets in North Vietnam. The Air Force's heaviest bomber, the B-52, carried 108 conventional bombs and pounded the country again and again. Nothing seemed to work well. The problems that you had in Vietnam were that we were basically fighting an infantry force that didn't present uh, very attractive targets for bombing. Uh, that the supply lines that we were attacking uh, were basically trails in the jungle. You had a lot of jungle cover, you had a lot of bad weather, and ultimately we were looking at the narrow end, the small end of a real big logistical funnel that we couldn't bomb the uh, production facilities that were supporting North Vietnam because they were in China and the Soviet Union. Once more, the limitations of, uh, of Vietnam are not anticipated by air commanders and I would argue perhaps by political leaders as well. Once more in Vietnam we fi find ourselves fighting uh, a, a communist ally of uh, the Soviet Union and now of the Chinese and we do not want the war to, uh, to evolve into a larger conflict and that is a great reason for uh, Lyndon Johnson's restrictions on the air war against North Vietnam. But no matter how ineffective strategic bombing was in Vietnam, it did provide an important breakthrough, the smart bomb. A smart bomb is basically a conventional bomb with a laser-seeking sensor, a guidance mechanism, and steering fins attached to the nose. A pencil-thin beam of invisible laser light is shown onto the target from the aircraft. When the bomb is released, it will steer itself toward the reflected light. Well, after we built the first dozen, the thought was put together that we'd take a special crew and a few special airplanes and deploy to, to northern Thailand and take 50 of them over and see if we can make them work in the theater. And uh, you got to realize we're talking vintage, mid-1966, and here are these engineers and other assorted military people who've shown up in an operational theater with a laser-guided something. And, and of course, it, it immediately got uh, looked at like it was a Buck Rogers idea. And so it had to prove itself very early on over there, and it did. It knocked down some bridges, which got attention, and then things began to move on. 25 years later, on the second night of the Gulf War, an F-111 returns from a combat mission over Iraq after dropping two laser-guided smart bombs. How'd it go? No good. No good. Just like it was planned. A little smooth. Tell us about it. What happened? Uh, we took off out of here, climbed up uh, medium altitude, went uh, across the border, and uh, found the airfield, the Dempy target, and uh, put our bombs right through what we wanted to put them through. Just like a training sortie, almost. My heart didn't think it was, but uh, it went good. It went good. As soon as the flight crew goes off for debriefing, the ground crew readies two more smart bombs for another sortie. The Air Force hopes that the war in the Gulf will finally erase the lingering frustrations and doubts about bombing's effectiveness. This time, all the signs are good. The enemy doesn't hide in the jungle, but sits in the desert. The United States is not bitterly divided over the need to fight. 
The end of the Cold War has eliminated fears of World War III. Three, two, one, launch. The strategy of terrorizing civilians with bombing has been abandoned, keeping direct civilian casualties low and making the air war more politically acceptable at home. And perhaps most importantly, the planes and weapons being used are finally sophisticated enough to make precision bombing work. Air power technology has finally caught up with air power theory. We've had theorists around since the days of Mitchell and Duhay that have described uh, what we did, but they didn't have the tools and the systems capable of achieving that. For example, in World War II, it took 9,000 bombs to get a significant amount of damage on a given target, that it took 200 bombs to accomplish in Vietnam. We were able to do that today with one bomb in one aircraft. No plane symbolizes the Gulf War better than the F-117 Stealth. Although officially a fighter, it was used here as a light bomber. For 15 years, the existence of the plane was a closely guarded secret. It carries only two smart bombs with a range of just 1,000 miles. But the F-117 does have something that no other plane has, a skin that absorbs and dissipates radar, making it almost impossible to detect. The stealth could be sent out alone at night without any fighter escort to the most heavily defended areas of Iraq. The impact of the F-117 was out of all proportion to its numbers and the amount of time it spent in action. Although the planes flew only 2% of the war's total sorties, they bombed 30% of all strategic targets. Not a single stealth was hit by enemy fire. I don't think there's any doubt that uh, stealth has revolutionized not only aerial warfare, but all of warfare. And I'm sure at some point in the time, there'll be some way to counter, to some effect, stealth technology. But I think that misses the point. All the existing conventional defenses now are built around radar technology, which is defeated by stealth. Let's go. In the last stages of the war, more than 200,000 Iraqi soldiers surrendered. Over 30,000 lay dead. Total coalition casualties were less than 500. The ground offensive required only a few days. To many, it was air power that deserved the credit. The answer is unequivocal that bombing won this war. And it won this war not because it was in the desert, not because it was against Iraq, but because the technology had come together, which allowed us to hit and to knock out those things on which any enemy depends, the communications, the command and control, the electricity. We, it, it, is not, it is not an anomalous win. It is a pattern for the future. But other experts are not so sure. One estimate is that half of all guided weapons landed within a few feet of their targets, an astonishing record compared to previous wars. But not all of these weapons actually destroyed their targets. I think there's no question that the precision guided bombing is more sophisticated now than it's ever been before. I think it is still uh, probably inaccurate to say that this is uh, pinpoint ac accuracy that uh, that you've got uh, you can just take the thing out with one shot uh, that has always been a a hope uh, it's sometimes been advertised it's uh, it's very difficult to achieve not every bomb is smart either in fact only eight percent of the munitions dropped in the war were guided Most planes aren't built to handle smart bombs, and the expense of using them is enormous. 